Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Good rainy church this morning, right? We were having a conversation over here with Amber and Isaac, and uh, I often say Baptists don't get baptized twice, so when it rains, it's less people. But then I said Presbyterians, since they're sprinkled, they got more room to get more water on them, you know, because Isaac attended a Presbyterian church, but he was dogs. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, 1 Samuel 26. 1 Samuel 26. In the life of David and the life of King Saul, this is a defining moment. I mean, David's been on the run for more than a decade uh, from Saul and from his persecution. And now at this point in time in the text, while you're looking for it, uh, David has been in hiding with his men. Saul got word where David was, and Saul drafted 3,000 soldiers and came to search for me. He put his soldiers all over the place, spies out there to see if he could find him. And when nighttime came, Saul is in his camp sleeping. And David knows where he is. So we're going to pick up at verse 6, if you would. Your notes may start at 7. Verse 6 reads this way. Then David answered and said to Elimelech the Hittite and to Abishah the son of Zerah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishah said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishah came to the people by night. And there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishah said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth. And I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishah, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away. And no man saw or knew it or awoke, but they were all asleep because of a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. So David went over to the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, great distance being between them. And David called out to the people, to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you calling out to the king? So David said to Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your Lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord the king. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son, David? David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done? For what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. So now, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I played the fool and erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much 
in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Because you've awakened us another day. You've given us another mini-resurrection. You've given us another opportunity to be pilgrims in this land, another opportunity to be sojourners, another opportunity to be light and salt for you, another opportunity to live as those in the outpost of heaven in this land. Another opportunity to exalt you here, to equip other saints here, to evangelize the lost here, another opportunity to be used by you until that day comes when we're in your presence. But Father, there are all kinds of things that clog up our attention, all kinds of things that get in the way, Lord God. And my prayer is that you're going to clear the way. You're, you're a way maker. You're the master of breakthroughs. So Father, I pray that you break through our minds so that we're attentive to you, our hearts, so it's not grieving your spirit, Lord God. And if any distractions would be planned by the enemy, that you would defeat them, Lord God. And Father, for me, I just present myself to you. Just as a vessel to be used. Whatever you pour in, Father, strengthen me to pour out. Whatever you say to me, give me strength to say it for you. And Father, if there's anything that I think to say that's not of you, then Father, stifle my tongue that I be obedient to you. Father, let your word ring true and let it land well, and let it bear fruit for the name of Jesus. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Relationships can be disrupted. Would you agree? Relationships can be disrupted. Is Bob Cropper here? He's going to regret not being here, because I'm going to talk about him. He'll see it online, Bob, if you're watching. Bob in his career traveled quite a bit. You know, he would go to places and inspect buildings. In this one particular moment, he went to a place and he was meeting up with somebody from the same company that he'd never worked before and didn't know. And because it was a little podunk place, they had to share a room. So Bob gets there, he goes into the hotel, he meets the fellow in the room, and you know, they converse a little bit. And now Bob had the habit of leaving his gold watch and his valuables in the room when he went off to do his job. But when he saw this guy, he didn't want to leave his valuables in the room. So he went away to get something to eat by himself, and he came back about 45 minutes later, and he stops at the desk clerk, and he said, I'm sorry to bother you with this, but normally I leave my valuables in the room, and I'm just not comfortable doing that with the person I'm sharing the room with. I don't really know them. So can I give them to you, and you put them in the hotel safe? And the clerk said, not a problem. The person you're sharing the room with was here a half hour ago for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> Relationships can be disrupted. And here's the interesting thing. If you think your relationships are the only ones that are wackadoo, and you think it's just our time that has bad relationships, you would be sadly mistaken. Because if you take a trip through the Bible, you're going to find that the Bible is very clear about disruptive relationships. And I'm not going to talk specifically about any particular relationship. Uh, what's on my heart to talk about is the way to address them in every different context drawn from the life of David. Let's just talk about a few. There are fussing friends in the scriptures. There's Paul and Barnabas that went on a mission trip together and, and shared the gospel in Asia. But John Mark went with them, and, and Mark decided he wanted to go back home, so he cut bait and got out of there. And when the next trip came up, Barnabas and Paul couldn't agree. Barnabas wanted, John, wanted Mark to go because that was Barnabas, right? He was a restorer. He was a redeemer of people. He was an encourager. But Paul was like, "Burn me once, he'll go get me twice." And what ended up happening, the scriptures show, is Barnabas and Paul actually split. Even after being on the mission field, these servants of the living God split at that point in time because of fuss of friends. You're fighting families. You can go back to the very beginning, chapter four of Genesis. After the beginning of creation of things and the fall, what happened? Yeah, Cain had Abel, right, brothers? How well did they get along? If you fought with your siblings, you're just following in the footsteps of the first family. Biblical. 
messy marriages. How about this deal? You can't have children, so you say to your husband, hey, I'm going to let you sleep with the servant, and when she has a child, I'll raise the child. How's that for a plan? Anybody see the train wreck coming? Abraham says, sure, wife, good deal. Until the baby is born, you know, Hagar's pregnant, and Sarai gets upset by it, and Abraham and Sarai, Hagar's life just runs off the rail. Not a good one. They're messy marriages. And if you don't want to deal with that one, go read the book of Hosea. If you want to talk about a messy marriage. When God says to a man of God, hey, I want you to marry a prostitute. Whew. Okay. Messy marriages. Conflicted churches. I mean, do churches have conflict? Everybody say amen. There was a story of six men. They ended up deserted on a deserted island. Two of them were Jewish, two were Catholic, two were Baptist. The two Jewish men got together and they formed a synagogue. The two Catholics got together and they established the Church of the Holy Name. The two Baptists couldn't get along, so they started two different churches and argued for the rest of their time over which one to be called first. <laughs> but church conflict isn't new. The book of 3rd John, John's third letter, is dealing with conflict in the church because of a man named Diotrephes that wanted to have preeminence in the church. And he wouldn't let the church host people that were coming. Any of the traveling itinerant preachers, he wouldn't let them come there because he wanted to have first place. Now that's in the word of God. It doesn't shy away from church conflict. Unless we forget, man out of relationship with God is the whole plot of the scriptures. From the beginning to the restoration at the end, it is man out of relationship, man out of his original design with God, and God seeking to restore. John 1, 4, in him was life, and life was the light of man, and light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, what? Did not comprehend it. Romans 1, 21 and 22, because all know that although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became So if you watch the news and you think everybody's crazy, it's biblical. Because when we forsake God, we're in the foolishness of our own thoughts. And that's where we are. Out of relationship with God, a dysfunction in the God family is biblical. So we get to David and we get to Saul's story. It's an example of a relationship disruption. I mean, David is the individual that when Saul wouldn't fight Goliath, David fought Goliath in Saul's place. Right? Because David, Saul was king. So when an enemy threatens the empire, right, the king should be the one that charges forward when no one else will to fight the battle for his nation. But Saul wouldn't do it. David did it. David defeated Goliath. When Saul was troubled, when Saul was distressed, what did David do, you biblical scholars? He played music. He played the harp, and the harp playing of David calmed Saul. Saul was married. David was married to Saul's daughter. So when David, when Saul calls him son, he really is. He's a son-in-law. They had this wonderful relationship. But in Saul's ego, in Saul's pride, and Saul was consumed by the fact that people were celebrating David and attesting more to him than they were to Saul. And that just warped his mind to where he was intent on destroying David and seeking to pin him to the wall and had been for more than a decade. That brings us up to this moment. And we can look at this moment, this defining moment, because after this, Saul goes away and Saul does not persecute David anymore. This is the last exchange between the two of them. We can look at this moment. We can find some nuggets about dealing with disruptive relationships that we can apply in our marriages, in with our siblings, with our workplace. Uh, we can find them all over and apply them all over the place. Number one, do no harm. Do no harm. There was a woman raised in an alcoholic, abusive family. And in that family, it was dog-eat-dog. 
I mean, it was a cutthroat family, and what you did was cut one another down in the family before they cut you down. And I mean, your intent was to eviscerate people, just to gut them, your family. And since she grew up with that, that was the practice of her life. In any relationship which she was in, if she felt the slightest bit of threat, or if she felt like she wasn't in command, she would cut whoever she was dealing with. And she became more and more troubled by doing it, more and more, uh, having more and more difficulty with living that kind of relationship. And she hooked up with a therapist, and she would call the therapist and talk to them. And one day on the phone, as she was sharing the circumstances of the current relationship she was dealing with, the therapist said, look, you're not nice. Can you imagine her thinking, I'm paying you to tell me that. He said, you're not nice. And she broke down in tears. She said, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be this way. What do I do? Next appointment, she went in to see him. He said, let's send her into a deal. Going forward, you agree to express yourself, to communicate your feelings, but in a way that does no harm to the relationship. You think about David. David was in a perfect position to exterminate Saul. And if he didn't want blood on his hands, he had a warrior right there with him that was willing to do the dirty work for him. He could say, look, I didn't kill Saul. God, I didn't kill Saul. My general did it. My warrior did it. But David determined to do no harm. Imagine if that were how we acted in our relationship. I'm doing pre-marriage counseling with two different couples. And I tell both of those couples that if you are fighting to win in the relationship, you are fighting for your spouse to lose. If you are fighting to win, you want your spouse to be a loser in that conversation. And it never lands well in people's lives when I say that to them, but they can't argue the truth. That's the truth of it. If I must command the hill, I don't want my spouse to win in this particular conversation that's going on. But we find in the scriptures that there's love to be applied. What are the two greatest commandments that Jesus shared? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? And second, and like it in it is to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, love does no harm. Love reflects the law of God. Paul said this, Romans 13, 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment of the law. Because Jesus said the law is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love does no harm. So in every communication, we have to approach it as children of the living God, as people of the word, to do no harm to the relationship. And that was very much David's approach. We, we, we have to ask ourselves, is what I'm getting ready to say, is what I'm getting ready to do going to reflect the character of God in this relationship? Is it going to maintain the relationship or is it going to wound the relationship? And if it's going to wound the relationship, then we refuse to do it. Do no harm. That was David's approach. Number two, leave justice to God. In verse 10, David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, for his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. Who was David leaving it up to? God. He wasn't taking responsibility for justice or revenge on his own. There was a woman who, when she was six years old, her mom ran off with a salesman. And the mom was out of her life, leaving this little six-year-old girl with a father who did the best he could. But he didn't know dating, and he didn't know dolls, and he didn't know tea parties and all of those other things. So this woman struggled through her childhood, struggled through teenagers, struggled through young adults, struggled to be a woman. And then that mother came back into her life, wanted to come back into her life. The mother called her back and wanted to have a meeting with her. And that woman went through all of the pain of her childhood, all of the things she did without not having a mother in her life, all of the ways she and her dad fumbled through life. And she went through that bout of, why should I welcome her back in? Why shouldn't she suffer? Why shouldn't she 
have to do some penance for the things that she did? Why shouldn't she go through life without her daughter the way I went through my childhood without my mother? Why doesn't she have to pay? Isn't that what we do with people? Often when they do wrong to us, we want them to experience some pain back. <laughs> Don't we want God to inflict some penalty on them to write the scale? Don't we want to be the one to write the scale? I mean, and how many of us, let's be honest, how many of us, if we were in that valley that day and Saul had been chasing us for more than 10 years and we had the opportunity to grab his spear and pin him to the ground, right? There, let's be honest. How many of us would have pinned him to the ground like a tail on a donkey? I pray the Lord would have prevented it for me, but I'm not too sure. If you made me suffer for 10 years and you tried to harm me that way, but David didn't do that because David left it up to God. Leave justice to God. Leave justice to God. Scripture says, never pay back evil for evil. Never avenge yourself. Leave that to God. For he has said that he will repay those who deserve it. See, what revenge does is revenge sets you up to seek to make someone else miserable. That's the goal of revenge. And the goal of revenge is counter to do no harm. We justify it by saying they did wrong, so they need to pay. But it is seeking someone's harm that they suffer without, or that they go through pain. So they have to do something to make amends. And in the process of seeking revenge, we do make someone miserable ourselves. Because it corrupts us inside, it makes us bitter. It gives us a broken attitude about people who are created in the image of the living God. So instead of justice and instead of revenge, what we're called to do is love our enemies. What we're called to do is if they're hungry, to feed them. If they're thirsty, to give them something to drink. What we're called to do is to forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. And that's easy, right? No, it's not. We're called to forgive. And what we need to remember is forgiveness doesn't diminish justice. It entrusts it to God. Forgiveness does not diminish justice. It entrusts it to God. That's what the Holy Spirit said through Paul. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The Lord never said, I'm not going to even the scale. I'm not going to enact justice, but I'm going to do it. It's not for you to do, because if you do it, it's going to go counter to loving people. It's going to mess you up. And one of the sure things about God is he doesn't want us to be messed up. Number three, confront humbly. Confront humbly. Verse 18, David, and he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done? For what evil is in my hand? If there is one thing lacking in our time, it is humility. We live in the age of me, the age of mine, the age of I'm right. And everybody else is wackadoo. The way I see things is the way they need to be. And if everybody would just see things the way I see things, the world would be a happy place, right? And if everybody did things the way I did things, the world would be a happy place, right? All the CNN people believe if everybody did CNN way, it would be a happy world. And all the Fox people believe if you did things the Fox way, it would be a happy world, right? That, that humility doesn't really exist well today. But what you see in David is you see the exercise of humility. David left himself open for his enemy to speak what the enemy saw into David's life. What have I done? Tell me. I'm leaving myself open. I'm not going to stand up on this hillside and say, I've done nothing to you. I haven't harmed you. I'm not going to just talk about my rightness. Speak into my life. Sir. You see, a humble person doesn't need to defend themselves. A humble person doesn't have to prove their point. A humble person will approach life teachable. A humble person will be open to criticism and to correction. 
A humble person doesn't need to lead. A humble person doesn't need to defend their rightness. And all of the disruption in relationships come from people trying to fight for their personal rightness. David doesn't do that. He lays it out there with God. And what does the scripture tell us? Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Go slow. Take the word slowly. Don't rush through that, right? Because it's a concept that can skip off the waters of your mind there. Let what be done? Nothing. So is there anything that we should do for selfish reasons? For conceited reasons? Let nothing be done that way. So we're talking about absolute humility here. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Lowliness of mind, let each esteem others. <laughs> uh, that exists in our society, doesn't it? Than himself. Doesn't even say equal. Now I want you to understand, this is the word of God. This is the word of God that was given to Paul by the Holy Spirit. This was inspired by God. This is God's word through Paul to us. God says, let nothing be done by selfish ambition or conceit. God says in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than himself. Isn't that what you see David doing? Tell me so. I took your spirit, took your jug. I didn't harm you. Tell me so. I, I, I wouldn't even harm you now, but tell me so. What have I done? What have I done that I can repent? What have I done that I can make a sacrifice? What have I done that I can right the wrong? Or is somebody else saying something to you? Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Also for the interests of others. This is what we see David doing. Number four. And probably the craziest out of all of them to me. Seek to restore. Look at verse 22. And David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of your young men come over and get it. He gives the spear back to the king. He gives the weapon back to the one who's been trying to kill him for more than a decade. All right, it's one thing to humbly ask a question. It's one thing to do no harm to the individual. It's one thing to uh, confront this way, but to give him the weapon back? Well, that, that's almost of that if someone hits you on one cheek, you turn the other one, right? Anybody here think they would do that? You're going to give the gun back, you're going to give the knife back, you're going to give the sling back, you're going to give the hammer back, you're going to give... To the person that just tried to whack you with it, that has 3,000 men pursuing you, and has been doing it, but David does that. And when David does that, what he's doing is saying, Saul, I'm going to entrust you to consider your choices. When he gives it back, he's allowing the Holy Spirit to work in Saul's life or in Saul's conscience, on his conscience. When he does this, he's allowing Saul to discipline his own mind and his own heart and to make a different decision that he's been making. It isn't that David's controlling the relationship from his side because he's got the weapon. He gives the weapon back and says, look, we can meet here on equal terms. I want to restore your king. This is your weapon. I'm a servant. I don't want to keep your weapon away from you. And we see this played out in the New Testament. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Paul was such a one, wasn't he? I mean, Saul was such a one. In David's life, he was such a one. A person who trespassed, a person who strove against him, a person who persecuted him and wanted to annihilate him. 
even though he couldn't speak any evil against David whatsoever. And now when David gave the sword back or the spear back to him, Saul had to come to terms with how he had been in the relationship. Remember, we're in the business of restoring, not punishing. Scripture tells us that we're to comfort those with the comfort we've been given. Have we been given punishing comfort? Or have we been given restoring comfort? Because when we look at what the Lord is doing, the Lord is giving us back what had been taken away from us. The Lord is restoring. When we look at the communion table, we see it's a form of restoration. It's a reminder of restoration taking place in Christ Jesus. And there's a series of things that we can look at. Number one, we see our position is being restored. What position is that? A position as a child of the living God. That's what you were meant to have. That's what sin took away from you. And in Christ, it's being given back to you. A powerful restore. Secondly, our love relationship with God. That relationship Adam had where he walked with God in the garden, where they were in communion together, is a relationship that sin took away from us, or we gave up in our rebellion and was lost. And we don't have that relationship with God, that perfect love relationship. Adam didn't have it. After his sin, the next thing you hear him say, the first thing you hear man say to God in the scriptures is, I heard you in the garden, I was afraid, and I hid myself from the shame. That's the first prayer you hear in the garden, in the, the word of God, is fear and hiding and shame. The love relationship had been ruined. Now, at the end of the scriptures, the last thing you hear man say in Revelation is, even so, come, Lord Jesus. No fear, no shame, no hiding, but desire for that relationship to be perfect. And the curtain of time to be let down. Why? Because of Christ. Because of what has been given back in restoration. And lastly, we find a restoration of our physical form. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That till he comes at the table reminds us that we look forward to a day where Christ is going to come in physical form. And those are dead in Christ's country. And we're going to be in physical serving Christ and worshiping him. What has been taken away is going to be given back and restore. How about Just as David's willingness to give the spirit of Saul, it takes the Lord's willingness to sacrifice for our restoration. It cost David to do what he did with Saul. It cost God what he's willing to do for you. It cost him his son. It costs the body of Christ, it costs the blood of Christ. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, beginning of verse 26. Jesus is celebrating Passover with his disciples. Verse 26, 27, 28, 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, from now on till that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> when we confess our sins, 
when we repent from those sins, turn away from them and turn to the living God in Christ Jesus. And we accept the grace offered for us in Christ and symbolized in the elements of communion. We are restored. Amen. Amen. Tommy, would you come and help me prepare the table, please? There is a term that exists in Christendom, not very familiar in our Baptist vernacular. I studied it years ago, but Kevin <coughs> Harrison mentioned it to me some time back, and I didn't remember what the word was. The word is intention. And the idea is of a common cup. Now, before you freak out and You'd have freaked out prior to COVID. Now with COVID, you freak out anymore when you hear me say that. Uh, Kevin and Sherry have helped me to come up with a simulation, I guess, of intention that we deem safe. Uh, and as the choir sings, you're going to be invited. Don't don't crowd. I mean, they, we, we will, I'll ask them to keep singing until everybody gets up here that wants to come. Bread has been sliced. It's about four inches long. It's separated on the plates, so it has distance between, and you only need to touch the one. Grab the one that's yours at the end, and dip the other end into a common cup. Let me repeat that for you, because we've never done this. In fact, I've never done this. All right, so this is new to me. There is a common cup. You're not going to drink from it. The bread has been separated, so there's distance. You grab the end of the bread. Don't put your fingers in the cup. Put the other end of the bread in the cup and take part as you go away. Does everybody understand? And there are cups here that if you're with someone that isn't that mobile, you can make uh, pull the elements of communion for them. Does everybody understand? Yeah. All right. So we'll start at front rows. And just work your way back. And don't crowd. Two sides. You can come up the side. You can come down the middle. And Tommy, I'll ask you if you'll stand over here. And I'll be on this side to help anybody that needs to be helped. And we'll be the bouncers at the altar table. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray for the elements of communion. Father God, thank you for being restorative. Because if you had been a different God, and David, a man after your own heart, would have done a very different thing in this disagreement with Saul. If you were a different God and David was after your own heart, David would have grabbed the spear and pinned him to the ground and said he deserved it because of his failings. But that's not who you are. And because David's after your own heart, that's not who David was. Instead, David chose to do no harm to the relationship. And that's the way you are with us. While you could have extinguished us, you chose to do no harm to the relationship. Oh, thank you, Lord. You chose to take care of justice by your own way, by putting our ills on your son instead of on us. You tried, chose to come at us humbly in the mind of Christ. When he could have come as king, he came as a servant. And you surely came to restore the relationship. And so, Father, because of that, we come to the table in remembrance of Christ. We come to the table with the juice, remembering it to be the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. We come to the table with the bread, simulating the body of Christ, remembering that his perfect life was broken up and given to us for our righteousness. And we take part because you have commanded us to do this until you come again. But Father, your word also tells us to examine ourselves before we come. That if we have any ill will against another, if there's any relationship hiccups in our life, that we're to abstain from this table until we get that relationship right and then we come to you. Father, I pray that we heed your word. Thank you for the sacrifice of Christ, and I thank you for the opportunity to take part of him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.